great gift of man over beasts has been his ability to craft and use tools. A simple stone axe gave man the power to shape the world around him. A spear could mean the difference between a family eating or starving. But the axe and the spear could also become weapons as individuals and tribes and eventually nations struggled against each other in their fierce determination to survive. The gun, too, has been both a tool for capturing game and a weapon for killing men. Guns gave individual men the power to hunt larger, more dangerous game and gave groups of men the power both to enforce and resist the will of rulers. The United States of America is a nation born well after the invention of firearms and whose size and influence expanded alongside the development and with the use of firearms. What were the guns that conquered the land that would become the United States and how did they develop? How did firearms change the course of this continent's future? And how were advancements in firearm technology used by men and even other nations throughout the American experience? Join us as we trace the history and development of the gun and the evolution of the firearm. Before there could be guns, there must first be gunpowder. Over a thousand years ago, a Chinese alchemist combined potassium nitrate with sulfur and charcoal with explosive results. It is commonly known that the carefully guarded secret mixture was used for fireworks, but the Chinese were quick to find military applications as well. Early weapons included gunpowder-packed arrows which would blast off like a rocket to explode into enemy lines. Over the next centuries, they would develop the first cannons and grenades as well. The fire lance appears to be the first handheld firearm. A hollow bamboo tube was filled with gunpowder and some small projectile. The weapon had a range of only a few feet, so it was used in hand-to-hand -hand combat attached to the end of a spear. Gunpowder remained a Chinese secret until the 13th century. It may have made its way to the West as part of the Mongol invasions of Persia and Eastern Europe. A Franciscan monk, Roger Bacon, appears to have witnessed the creation and use of the powder in fireworks. He described the use of saltpeter, sulfur, and charcoal, and wrote around 1250 A.D., the sound of thunder may be artificially produced in the air with greater resulting horror than if it had been produced by natural causes. Cannons were used by Moors in Spain in the mid-13th century, and then later, by the 14th century, the King of England was using cannons against the Scots. During the Hundred Years' War, the English and French both dragged cannons to the battlefield. Perhaps it was inevitable that some brave and industrious person would attempt a smaller, handheld version of this thundering weapon. The original firearm was a hand cannon. Although there is evidence that hand cannons were used in 12th century China, it wasn't until the mid-1300s that they were used in Europe. 
These ancestors of the modern firearm truly were just hand-sized versions of the cannons used against castle walls. Simple metal tubes, usually made of bronze. On one end, a small touch hole is used to ignite the gunpowder. The other end is open, and from it blasts a deadly projectile and foul-smelling black smoke. It could fire a lead ball, a heavy stone, or even a handful of gravel. As fearsome as it might sound, the weapon was cumbersome. It was best mounted against a solid surface to keep it from blasting back into the chest of the gunner. The gunner must concentrate carefully when lowering a hot coal or burning rope to the touch hole, which meant that the gunner was not concentrating on the actions of his enemy. Accuracy suffered, and there is some debate regarding the effectiveness of these arms of fire as useful weapons in the field. Firearms development is obviously centered on the initial discovery and development of gunpowder, or as we call it today, black powder. It was developed in the Far East. The Chinese uh, are accredited with the, uh, the first black powder uh, developments. And uh, it wasn't too long before black powder originally used uh, for rockets and uh, for signaling and, and for fireworks, just as they are still currently used today to mark celebrations. Those were the initial uses that the Chinese uh, put gunpowder to when it was first developed. It took a while for it to uh, travel to the West and, uh, and find a home in Europe. And it was through the introduction of gunpowder to the Europeans that firearms first began uh, to, to show themselves on the uh, scene. Uh, we know that as early as 1350, uh, a hand cannon was developed uh, that would fire projectiles with the aid of gunpowder. The, the uh, gunpowder basically is a, uh, uh, a substance that when ignited uh, through a spark or other means uh, explodes or basically, uh, more technically, burns, creating a, a tremendous amount of gases and pressure uh, that's ideal for pushing a projectile down a, uh, a long tube or barrel as they evolved. As the 14th century advanced, so did the technology of the gun. Key advances included adding a wooden stock so that the gunner could brace the weapon on his shoulder. Even more important was the change in the ignition process. The goal was to allow the gunner to sight down the barrel of the gun while applying the igniting spark to the gunpowder. Gun makers conceived of a kind of locking system in which a lever, think trigger, was used to move the igniter to the powder. The match lock was the first truly effective lock system and worked by lowering a slow burning match to the ignition powder. The first firearm produced in large numbers was the arquebus and was put to furious use in the Italian wars of the 16th century. The arquebusiers, soldiers wielding these cutting edge weapons, could have a tremendous impact upon opposing armies. Though the loading and firing of these old firearms can seem ponderous in comparison to modern guns, it had a faster rate of fire than the crossbow. Meanwhile, the arquebus could be mastered more quickly and in larger numbers than the longbow and was more powerful than either bow. At first, the arquebus was particularly useful against cavalry, especially when partnered with pikemen. This pike and shot formation revolutionized the Spanish army, which used it to defeat the French in the Battle of Cernola in 1503. The arquebus could fire a heavy lead ball, but it could also fire small shot, which would scatter into the face of a charging foe. In his commentaries, Captain Blaise du Montluc of France described some battles involving arquebusiers fighting alongside soldiers with more traditional weapons. 
The company I commanded was no other than crossbows, for at this time the use of the arquebus had not as yet been introduced among us. Then six Gascon arquebus came to us from the enemy, which I had received into my company. It wasn't long before de Montluc had squadrons of arquebusiers under his command, but he himself would fall victim to a shot from an enemy arquebus. He survived the wound, but his face was shattered. Would to heaven that this accursed engine had never been invented. I had not then received these wounds which I now languish under. Neither had so many valiant men been slain, for the most part by the most pitiful fellows and the greatest cowards that had not dared to look at those men in the face, which at distance they laid dead with all their confounded bullets. What made these arms particularly deadly was a development of volley fire. Again, the Spanish were using a version of volley fire in the early 16th century. The German Count Wilhelm Lodwig wrote at the end of that century, I have discovered a method of getting the musketeers and soldiers armed with arquebuses, not only to keep firing very well, but to do it effectively in battle order. That is to say, they do not skirmish or use the cover of hedges in the following manner. As soon as the first rank has fired together, then by the drill they will march to the back. The second rank, either marching forward or standing still, will fire together and then march to the back. After that, the third and following ranks will do the same. Thus, before the last rank has fired, the first will have reloaded. As good as the advancement that the matchlock was, it still had drawbacks. It was difficult to keep the slow match lit in wet weather. And in dry weather, failure to keep the lit match away from stored powder could have disastrous results. Unintended explosions aside, the burning match created both a glow that could be seen by an enemy at night and an odor that could be smelled, giving away the gunner's position. But this was the Renaissance period and advances were taking place in all disciplines. The new art of gun making was not an exception. The wheel lock applied the engineering of clockwork to the problem of igniting gunpowder. The wheel lock was a spring-loaded steel wheel wound tight like a watch until it caught or snapped against the trigger. When the trigger was pulled, the wheel would spin against a piece of pyrite generating sparks which would then ignite the gunpowder in the priming pan. The wheel lock allowed cavalry to take greater advantage of firearms. It was difficult to keep the slow match of a matchlock gun lit while riding horseback, a problem eliminated by the wheel lock. It was also easier for cavalry to fire smaller, one-handed guns. Beginning in the 16th century, it was customary for cavalrymen in Europe to carry a brace of pistols into battle in saddle holsters. These were, after all, still single-shot weapons. But the complex design of the wheel locks meant that they were expensive to produce. The common soldier was not afforded such arms. They were more commonly used in hunting, while matchlocks were predominant in the militaries of Europe. Of course, what truly made the guns effective was the incredible destruction they wrought upon the human body. Even armored knights could be taken down at close range. For a time, armorers tried to compensate by building and designing heavier body protection. When the Spanish conquistadors arrived in the New World, it was that body armor, in fact, rather than the firearms they carried, that was of greater military use in their assaults on the native populations. The arquebus was effective, of course, both in terms of physical destruction and as a source of terror for the natives. 
but they, like the crossbows, were slow to load. But the crossbow and arquebus alike had developed in large part as a response to the heavy armor of the Spanish knights. The Aztecs, Incas, and other native populations had nothing that could pierce Spanish armor. Of course, the absolute deadliest weapon that Europeans brought to the New World was smaller than the eye could see, the germ. Smallpox and other maladies wreaked havoc among the natives of South and North America, while Europeans on the other side of the world continued to perfect the art and science of guns. The complexity and cost of the wheel lock was sufficient incentive for brave and industrious smithies to experiment with other means of igniting the black powder. It had long been known that you could start a fire by striking flint against steel, producing sparks. In the mid-16th century, someone applied this principle to firearms. The first example was known as a snap lock. A piece of flint was held by a set of jaws in the gun's cock. When the cock was pulled back, it would catch against a small lever. When the trigger was pulled, the lever pulled back and the cock snapped forward, striking the flint against a steel plate. The force of the strike would push the plate back, exposing the gunpowder in the pan, at the same time that the flint drew sparks from the steel. Some gunsmiths in England, and later in America, included a safety catch called a dog lock. Although the snap lock system used flint against steel, it is not considered a true flint lock. These weapons were valued by militaries, but also by other less reputable groups. The late 16th and early 17th centuries were the glory days for the infamous pirates of the Caribbean. These outlaw sailors terrorized ships and towns among Caribbean isles during colder months and then struck out for New England during the heat of summer. Wielding cutlasses and flintlocks, the pirates were a fearsome threat to the unwary. Many New England pirates actually began as privateers, hired and commissioned by the colonies to strike at ships owned by England's enemies. But when England was no longer at war with those nations, the privateers could turn to piracy. To defend the colonies against external threats, including pirates, but more often hostile native tribes, governors established local militias. Every able-bodied male was expected to serve in the militia, and every home was expected to have at least one working firearm. The militias drilled in tactics such as volley fire and quick response to emergency bells. They built solid defenses around each village and kept their powder dry. But in contrast to professional armies, the militias were loosely structured and generally only met a few days a year to drill. The militia were required to provide their own weapons. Often, these were fouling pieces. These were popular for their versatility able to fire a single large ball or a handful of shot for hunting waterfowl. English colonies struggled in their relations with the native populations. Though these were friendly relations at times, there were also periods of conflict. During a conflict known as King Philip's War, New England colonists and their own Native American allies battled against a confederation of other native tribes. In that war, a colonialist named Benjamin Church emerged to form a company of colonialists and allied natives. Church learned the natives' tactics for moving through the forests and swamps undetected and fighting a more guerrilla style than was known to Europeans. These were the first American ranger forces, and Benjamin Church is considered the father of American ranging. These skills proved valuable for the conflicts did not end when one of Church's native allies killed the so-called King Philip, a native chieftain. From the late 1600s, almost up to the American Revolution, there are a series of wars between English colonials and French colonials, 
each having their own allies among the Native American tribes. The most famous is the last one, known in America simply as the French and Indian War, ending in 1763. But there were others, with Europeans and Natives alike, wielding muskets in their struggle for control of the New World. Within the broad categories of matchlocks, wheel locks, and flintlocks, there was a wide variety of gun designs. Wheel lock dueling pistols. And, like any art, gunsmithing drew its artists. Guns made for nobility might include beautifully carved gold or silver designs. One well-known style of gun was the blunderbuss. This might be a shorter musket or a pistol, marked by the flared muzzle at the end of its short steel or brass barrel. The broad opening at the top made loading the powder and shot easier and faster, and the blunderbuss could be devastating at short range, usually firing a handful of lead shot. The blunderbuss is strongly associated with the pilgrims in American mines, though those early colonists made use of other firearms as well. The 75 caliber flintlock musket, known as the Brown Bess, was the standard for British soldiers through 18th and early 19th centuries. The Brown Bess musket is English in origin, and this is based on the muskets they developed in the early 18th century, roughly around 1722, and these muskets uh, are what won the English their empire around the world. These muskets are all roughly around 75 caliber, smooth bore muskets, and they use a flintlock as the system of ignition. And this particular example is a copy of the shortland pattern musket that was developed just prior to the American Revolution. Uh, this example has uh, the mark Tower on the lock plate, indicating that it had been inspected in the Tower of London. These things were battle winners in their time. Uh, they are smooth bore and inherently inaccurate. They are only accurate out to about 50 to 75 yards. Anything greater than that, the accuracy really drops off quite a bit. Uh, this thing is quite simply loaded. A soldier would take a cartridge from his cartridge pouch, normally worn at the waist or from a broad sling on their right hip. They would draw a cartridge from their pouch, bring it to their mouth, tear it open, pour a little bit within the pan, shut the pan, pour the remainder of the gunpowder down the barrel. They would draw out this long iron ramrod and ram the whole cartridge down with a tamp and return the rammer to the pipes just underneath of the barrel. Then the soldier was ready to fire. A good soldier was supposed to be able to fire three shots in a minute. I know I've seen people that can get between four and five shots in a minute with one of these is uh, really quite a feat. The comparable gun among the French was the Charleville musket, a 69 caliber smooth bore musket. These muskets were standard issue for French infantry after 1717. Named for the armory in the Charleville Mezières, Ardennes, France, the Charleville, like the Brown Bess and other smooth bore muskets, was accurate to around 50 to 100 yards. The 1717 Charleville had a pinned barrel, like the Brown Bess, but the 1728 model would have three barrel bands instead. This was easier to disassemble and clean 
and was a stronger design for bayonet combat. The gun was about 60 inches long and about nine pounds. The Charleville and Brown Bess were sturdy, dependable flintlocks, perfect for their intended purpose. The goal was not individual accuracy. When the armies of Europe met on the field, they gathered into formation and fired volley after volley of heavy lead balls into the opposing forces. The soldiers could load and fire roughly three shots per minute. As the smoke from the black powder made it difficult to see, even within the limited range of their guns, they did not place a high value on marksmanship. Once their shot was spent, the soldiers would affix bayonets. With bayonets attached, the long guns were effective pikes for use against cavalry and could be deadly hand-to-hand -hand weapons as well. The Charleville and Brown Bess, like most firearms of that day, were smooth bore muskets. It had been known for some time that a rifled barrel could fire a bullet further and more accurately. A rifled barrel has a pattern of twisting grooves which gives the projectile a spin as it leaves the barrel. That spin gives the bullet stability. But rifled barrels were more prone to fouling by the black powder used during that period. Also, for a bullet to take advantage of the rifling, it would need to fit tightly into the barrel. This made loading more difficult. Smoothbore guns like the Brown Bess and Charleville could be reloaded more quickly and military tactics at the time did not require the range or accuracy afforded by rifles. But hunters could appreciate both of these characteristics. In America, in the mid-18th century, rifles were being made by smiths in Virginia and Pennsylvania. Though fouling pieces and European-styled smoothbores were popular and common, the rifles were the truly American-made guns. The American long rifles were developed by gunsmiths of German ancestry. On the frontier, a hunter's powder and shot were in short supply. Whereas European armies needed to load and fire as quickly as possible without regard for an individual's accuracy, the frontier hunter needed to hit his target on the first shot or else see his family's dinner bound off into the woods far faster than he could hope to reload. The time would come when the ranger tactics learned and developed by Benjamin Church and the marksmanship of the American hunters would be put to a different use. Tensions between the American colonies and the British government were growing. Committees of safety were cropping up all over the colonies taking control of the militias, watching out for royal encroachment on colonial rights, and eventually gathering arms for the coming conflict. When I was a kid growing up and reading about the uh, causes of the American Revolution in the uh, history books in school, I was under somewhat of a uh, uh, misguided notion that the American Revolution began because of uh, a number of things that had set the colonists off against uh, King George III. Uh, unreasonable taxes, tax without representation, the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, all these things had conspired to ferment a level of, uh, of unrest in New England. And uh, the American Minutemen uh, were called to bring out their squirrel rifles uh, after Paul Revere's ride and, uh, and meet at Lexington Green. And they, uh, they started the, uh, the American Revolution on the morning of April 19th, 1775. The thing that I found through more research and study is that it was far more involved and evolved than that. The American Revolution had its seeds going back to the French and Indian War almost uh, 20 years earlier. Uh, uh, certainly 10 years earlier uh, when things like the Boston Massacre uh, be, you know, occurred. The, uh, the colonials had a great stock of personal firearms as they were used by just about everybody uh, for personal sustenance, uh, to be able to hunt with, to uh, provide meat on the dinner table. 
for those living in a uh, in an urban uh, setting such as Boston, Cambridge, New York City, uh, there were committees of safety that had been established. Uh, those were basically local militia units and at that time they weren't seen as being uh, used in the defense of the colonies against the crown of England uh, but more for the mutual protection and defense against whether it was the French or, uh, or still prevalent bands of, uh, of Native Americans. Uh, not everybody had a, uh, a rifled you know, musket or long rifle, uh, but where committees of safety were established, they had firearms that equaled or surpassed the quality of the brown bass of the British infantry. These were generally 69 or 75 caliber muskets, smooth bores. Uh, when Paul Revere did make his famous midnight ride uh, on the night of April uh, 18th and, and alerted the countryside to the fact that uh, General Gage had sent yet another column out into the, uh, into the countryside near Lexington and Concord, he was alerting the, the Minutemen uh, to come to their uh, rally points. This time, the, uh, the reason for the marches outside of Boston was different from all the other different marches that the British troops had made in the years uh, leading up to that one morning. This time, Gage's orders to Major Pitcairn were clear and precise. You will remove all stands of arms, powder, shot, projectiles, and artillery from the colonists as you encounter them. Uh, that was the line in the sand. When Captain John Parker assembled his 80 men on Lexington Green, he told them, do not fire unless fired upon. If they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Disarm them. Charge bayonets. <laughs> Charge your bayonets. Next. Ah. Fire. Do not fire. Do not fire. No. Go on. Fall back. And soon would come the shot heard round the world. Patriots throughout the colonies would put muskets to shoulder and fight for their liberty. A liberty that would be forged in battle, achieved and defended by the American gun and the evolution of the firearm.
Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.